And now I'll pass this over to our panel. Uh, please welcome Preeti Pinchit, Director of Sustainable Systems, Sustainability, Climate and Equity Offering at Deloitte, who will be our moderator. Christina Shim, Global Head of Product, IBM Sustainability Software. Joanne Swap, Vice President of Operations at Suncommon. And Rumaitha Albusaidi, Omani Marine Scientist, Scientist, Advocate for Environmental Youth Leadership. And sorry, my English is having a hard time this morning. Um, thank you for being here and let's get this started. Yeah, thank you so much, Maricela. Well, I am Preeti, Preeti Pincha. As Marisela said, I'm the director of the Sustainable Systems Initiative at Deloitte, and I have the great pleasure of facilitating this morning's session on gender equity and climate change. As a daughter of a human rights activist uh, and disability rights activist who was blind himself, this topic, as you can imagine, is very close to my heart, and I have been working on it since my early childhood days. Um, it is it is rather appalling to note that women are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change than men are. And global, women globally are 14 times more likely to die in a climate event and four times more likely to get displaced. Now, as you can imagine, they constitute a majority of the world's poor and are most dependent on livelihood on natural resources that are threatened by climate change not to mention the economic, the social, the cultural, political barriers that they face day in and day out that limit their capacity to cope. Now, to expound on these very issues and to begin to unpack the challenges as well as the opportunities that come at the intersection of gender equity and climate change, I am delighted to be joined by three very perspicacious and very passionate panelists. We have Rumaita al Busedi, who is the Omani, who is an Omani marine scientist and an environmental activist working on sustainable solutions on climate change. And she serves on the board of the only environment NGO in Oman, the Environment Society of Oman, and actively works with the government on um, creating sustainable diversification strategies. Internationally, I know Rumaita, you've advised the Biden administration on developing uh, climate resilient standard for U.S. foreign aid, and also work with the Arab League on empowering young Arab women in uh, and, and youth in the climate change negotiation space. Rometa is also the first ever Arab member uh, a youth of the Youth Council on Climate Change and is a co-chair of the economic World Economic Forum's Davos Lab. So nice to have you, Rometa. It's a pleasure to be here. Then we also have Joanne uh, Swap, who is the Vice President of Operations at Suncommon, uh, and where she guides and leads the team in maintaining superior solar installation, a key component of the energy transition. Uh, she previously spent three and a half years managing engineering and operations for Integra Optics, a fiber optic component company, leading them through their acquisition by Infinite Electronics in 2019. Now, prior to uh, your career in the private sector, Joanne, we love that you served 22 years in the U.S. Navy, where you completed numerous deployments on board several naval vessels, serving in different capacities from an engineer to a ship driver uh, to an anti-terrorism officer. What a pleasure to have you on board as well, Joanne. Thank you. Glad to be here. And last but never the least, my good friend Christina, uh, Christina Shim. Christina heads the globe, is the global head of product and strategy at IBM Sustainability Software. In this role, she oversees product management for sustainability software and owns the overarching growth business development, as well as leading IBM's sustainability platform for technology. Now, prior to IBM, she was the managing director and head of New York for Palladium International, a global impact firm where she built the commercial innovation practice. Previously, she has worked with several top tier management consulting firms globally and has mentored entrepreneurs at various venture funds and has served on board as advisors to fintech and climate tech startups, accelerators and nonprofits. So lovely to have you uh, here, Christina. Yes, amazing to be here. Thanks, Preeti. 
Well, just to set the order of proceedings for today, while I have a set of questions to get us ladies started, uh, let's uh, reserve some time, as, as Megan uh, told us before, uh, towards the end of the session to take in a few questions from the audience. Um, and an audience, feel free to write your questions in the chat uh, section. We would love to make this as interactive as, um, as possible. All right, without further ado, let's get started. And perhaps uh, let's begin by unpacking how gender equity and climate change intertwine and explore how women, more particularly women of color, women from economically disadvantaged communities uh, are impacted by climate change. And this is a question to all of you and maybe we take turns in going through it um, and we can start with you, Rumetha, and then go on to Joanne and Christina. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would um, basically start off by saying that as we kind of kind of go into uh, climate change and really looking into it, historically, we've seen that a lot of climate change scientists, researchers, policymakers have all um, struggled with making the vital connections between gender, social equity and climate change, to be specific, which is why when we actually talk about climate change, these discussions are only coming up now. Um, and uh, the main reason behind that is we're kind of seeing more and more data and research that is revealing a really clear correlation um, between uh, climate change and the linkages with um, gender. Uh, specifically, if we look at it in terms of the crisis itself, it's not gender neutral. We're seeing women and girls experiencing the greatest impacts of climate change, which amplifies al already what is existing when it comes to gender inequalities, uh, specifically the unique threats uh, when it comes to their livelihood, health and safety. So if we look across the world, um, we're seeing more and more women depend more on yet um, um, on the ability to actually get more water, for instance, and livelihood on natural resources. And in many regions, women actually bear disproportionate responsibility for securing that food, securing that water and that fuel. Um, and if we go even delve into deeper into, for instance, agriculture, we're seeing the most important employment aspect of that actually employs a lot of women who are actually disproportionately impacted when climate change impacts such as floods, cyclones, impact that sort of livelihood. So as a result of that, we're seeing those uh, numbers come in where we're saying that the majority of the poor are already women and they're impacted as a result of that. But we're also seeing that uh, the UN came, came up with a, a number when we're looking at climate uh, migration as well. 80% of those who are impacted with climate migration are actually women. Um, and if you look into the aspect as well of what is the first thing uh, when a family kind of is hit by a disaster, the first thing that actually goes is a woman's asset because it's much more liquid, be it jewelry, be it the things that you actually own in the house that you can kind of let go of versus what a man actually owns, which is mostly land and things that are very difficult or more um, difficult to make liquid in that instance of time. So with that in mind, um, I would really urge people to kind of look at it from that lens and that would make it much more clearer how climate change actually is not gender neutral at all. Interesting. Yeah, to, yeah. To expand on that, um, just a little bit, the when you're talking about a crisis and the response to a crisis, it's shown that the distribution of wealth is directly tied to your ability to move out of the way and your ability to recover from a crisis. In addition, your access to health care and to shelter and to safe shelter for women is very unequal when it comes to response, because in many parts of the world, the response is directed by men. And so the very first thing that, that is not on the front of their mind is what do we need to do specifically for women? So there are shelters that are overcrowded. Women are the caregivers that are taking care of their family. So a lot of time they're putting their family first above their needs, which impacts their health, their well-being, their mental state. So you see that disparity across the genders and also across the uh, economic distribution around the world when it comes to the ability to just recover and even prevent being in the way of a natural disaster, which we're seeing stronger natural disasters and more and more and more throughout uh, the world every year. So that, that 
impact on women and, and lower income families is just astronomically larger than in other areas of the world and with other genders as well. I think um, Joanna and Ramitha have done a really good job of setting the tone of what the challenge is. I will add just one point as, uh, as a positive, which is I think 70% of current chief sustainability officers of companies are also women right now. And so we are also, while disproportionately affected negatively, right? We are also hopefully increasingly the agents of change in order to make a difference. And I think that is also something that I take heart in as we're trying to deal with something that is bigger than any one of ourselves. It's great to see women stepping up into these roles where they can hopefully make changes as you see with the women um, on, this, on this stage, but elsewhere as well. So it's the only other point that I'd add to that. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. In fact, uh, it is it is very heartening to see a lot of the women in the sustainability sector. But then there is a counter to that, uh, Christina, is also that more and more people think that climate and social issues are a topic of women, and there is almost a bias on the mm. other side. So mm. that uh, we need to normalize the fact that men also take care of climate and they are equal stakeholders in in the conversation as well, I suppose. Yeah. But I know, Rumeta, you have worked uh, some, you know, brilliantly with the Biden administration on climate resilience standard for US foreign aid, which primarily focused, if I understand this right, on empowering women as the form of climate mitigation. So would you talk to us a little bit more about that? Because I think that is very interesting and kind of gets to the point on how gender equity translates itself to saving our climate. Uh, and also how women become key to, you know, helping this transition. Definitely. And I agree with you that women are actually the agents of change when it comes to a lot of the things that we're seeing in the world, not only from the climate perspective, but in a lot of the social justice, fiscal justice that we're looking at, we need to kind of include more women in general in all of these spaces and empower them. Um, so the work that I did with the Biden administration kind of looked more on the foreign aid aspect. So if we actually look in general in the foreign aid uh, sphere, a lot of that aid kind of comes in and money of immediate things that are needed to kind of be purchased for disaster relief. And um, it's seldom um, that that funding actually goes to capacity building as it is. And that's what is needed in a lot of these spaces to actually make sure that there is some sort of sustainability when it comes to um, a community's resilience in actually responding to a crisis. So the work um, actually started with um, how do we kind of change that narrative of, yes, USAID is not only going to come in and just give cash, how can we kind of um, implement programs as well that would be able to kind of build that capacity? And the main aspect was to actually focus on women. Main reason behind that is actually uh, due to empirical research and studies that have proven that if you are looking at a way to empower or to mitigate climate change as a whole in general, the number one solution is actually empowering women because they are actually, it's um, a multiplier effect that women actually have. Uh, women have a tendency of sharing that uh, principles that they have learned with their community. Um, they are the mothers, they are the nurturers of their community as well. So that will be passed on. And the same time, um, um, you have the other aspect of they are much more of a empathetic leader that would be able to kind of help people when they are struggling as well within their communities. So from that perspective, it was very important to kind of look into how do you empower more women to be able to kind of pass on that work in various spheres and spaces in order for them to actually make sure that not only are they the community resilient, but they're also powerful enough to actually build those systems in place in order for them to continue and sustain. So from that angle, that was the work that I did with the Biden administration. And it's been amazing. Um, they've implemented uh, the program in Africa at the moment. So it's just now waiting for, to see the results of that. And hopefully it, it reaps the rewards that we're all looking forward to. Inshallah. Absolutely. And also, you, you do bring up this good point, right, that we need to empower women and place them in the center of decision making. And Joanne, I know you are at the heart of this current energy transition that's happening. 
what does energy justice mean to you in that context? And why do we need to tread rather rather gingerly when it comes to the development of the infrastructure, the green infrastructure, be it the buildings, the public support, the charging the EV station, charging station, etc., as we transition to this kind of newer, low to no carbon economy and sustainable economy? Yeah, uh, so energy justice, also termed energy uh, equity sometimes, what it focuses on is the decision making, the access, the affordability, and the impacts of our current infrastructure, and then the transition, as you mentioned, to a renewable green infrastructure. And some of the ties there deal with the uh, energy burden, which has to do with the affordability of energy. As you go from a uh, higher household income to a lower household income, you still use basically the same amount of energy a lot of times. So your proportion of how much you're spending of your income really jumps as you have a lower income coming in. The, the percentage is just higher of how much you're actually spending of what you're bringing in that you have less you know, money for other things. And so the impact there when we talk about um, minority groups and women is that Overall, around the world, women do have the lower incomes around the world. We deal with the, the equity of pay around the world. There's just It's just the reality. And so as women have a lower income coming in, lower household income, that cost of energy is just significantly more from that for them. The other part we deal with is the what we call energy poverty, and that's access to energy. And you can think of under uh, developing countries where there isn't a grid, and so there's not as much access, and we talk about um, the natural disasters are pushing those resources further and further away and where women are the most responsible in the family in general for collecting that firewood or coal to heat and to um, cook their food, they're spending more and more time having to do that. It's further away. It's much harder for that uh, individual family to get what they need. But to bring it even closer into the, to the US, if you look in California, for many years, they've had rolling blackouts, which happen frequently in the summertime when everyone's air conditioning is on and the grid just cannot sustain the demand. And when you look at a rolling blackout, wherever you're living, it tends to impact you differently. And as we have lower income households that have higher densities in an area, it impacts them at a higher rate when there's a rolling blackout that comes through. If you have five houses on a block or a hundred households on a block, obviously that the, the area that's a hundred households is gonna be impacted with a higher significance. And so those rolling blackouts do impact women and uh, marginalized groups at a much higher rate. And so there's examples all around the world where access to that energy is just not equitable across uh, populations and across different sects of, of, the, of society. And then the last thing that we talk about with uh, the energy justice is energy democracy. And what energy democracy ties to is the wonderful concept of a community having a say in where their energy goes. And there's different ways to do that, but we see that as we look across communities around the world, women just have less voices. And so that energy democracy that we talk about and that we definitely need to focus on, we need to be bringing the women's voices into that. And the, an example of this is many cities across the country try to um, set up their public transportation to be effective for the nine to five. That's when most commutes happen. Well, what that doesn't take into account is school drop-off schedules or women who have to adjust for daycare and dropping off their children. So it, that's just one example of a decision that really isn't taking into account the need of everyone in the community. It's really focused on doing something good for our environment, which is great, but it's not taking everyone's voice and hearing what everyone needs to be able to really support that type of change. Uh, so, you know, ideally a just energy system around the world would be an equitable sharing of not just the energy, but the burden of developing the energy across the world so that everyone has the benefits, everyone takes on a little bit of the burden of the distribution, of the uh, production and of the consumption. So that's where we, we look at when we look at energy justice. And I think everything we've been speaking about up to this point really shows yeah. that there is definitely the inequitable distribution across uh, society there. That's right. And actually, as we move into this, or as we get into this transition mode, it's not, we can't do it alone. We have to do it collectively. So it's a, 
it's the government agencies, it's the it's the corporate houses, it's the civil society, it's the communities, and uh, and hence actually my mission at the Sustainable Systems Initiative at Deloitte is to look at these issues systemically rather than in silos. Because if you start looking at it in silos, you only solve for one particular pattern, like you're saying, it's the office workers. But when you look at it more systemically as to who the stakeholders are uh, and design a uni universally designed for it, I think that has so much more power to make it equitable. And, and in that context, uh, uh, Christina, as you, as you can imagine, like corp organizations, particularly corporates, uh, you know, they have the power to empower women to lead the way in fighting the climate crisis. Um, specifically, you know, by making strategic choices, both at the corporate level, as well as at the business unit level. And I think there is definitely a distinct role for technology uh, in, in all of this. So would you expound a little bit on what do you think organizations can do uh, to empower women in this transition? Yeah, so technology, you know, I like to say technology is not going to solve the world, but it will help to accelerate where you need to go to change the world, right? Um, and oftentimes, I think as an accelerator, as an enabler of change, technology is actually really critical in order for us to achieve our goals. A lot of things that we're trying to do across companies, organizations, how, however big or small, in this decarbonization journey, folks are trying to do manually and it's not going to reach the scale that it needs to without technology to help to enable that. So some concrete examples around that, for example, you know, you hear a lot about the decarbonization and net zero commitments that a lot of corporations have. I think every corporation has that now. Most large enterprises and organizations in general have that now. That's wonderful. But what does that mean? And how do you actually action on that, right? Because it's great to have that articulation of commitment, but you actually need to operationalize it. You need to do something about it. Um, I, I joke that I hope in 10 years, there's no such thing as a chief sustainability officer. It should just be embedded in every single part of the business, every single part of any organization's mission. It should just be kind of part of what you do. And it's really at the end of the day, from a business perspective, from a corporate perspective, it's good business. You're talking about energy efficiency. You're talking about diversity of um, how you think about, you know, the business and bring different voices to the table. You're talking about leveraging technology to help you achieve those goals. And it needs to be embedded in like the factory workers and the supply chain officers and everyone that's working in the data centers. And, you know, it's kind of everybody across. And so um, it really is a way, if you want to say, to democratize how we achieve these goals. It is not going to be a CEO or a CSO that ends up changing how we actually make change in the world. It's going to be all of us and all of us, but I mean, everyone that's on listening here, it's, in, it's on all of us to be able to do that, leveraging technology to help us to achieve those goals faster. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully and increasingly, a lot of corporations are focused on bringing women in to help to facilitate those goals and to make sure that they're bringing in diverse voices in order to do that across the board. I know um, a lot of organizations, ours included, they, they have compensation and incentives that are tied to executives bringing in diversity as part of what they're doing, right? I think that's really important because behavior is all about, it's all, it's all by incentives. And so how do we make sure that that is where we are focusing our energy? It's around you know embedding it as part of your business. It's about bringing in the right people um, whether it's women or not, I mean, I think it's, you know, we want to make sure that we have the right voices at hand and that we are then using technology to be able to, to accomplish those goals. So uh, from where I sit, it's really, it's amazing. You know, the, the momentum in the last year and a half has been phenomenal in this space. And while you can be cynical and say, hey, some folks are just focused on it from a business perspective, it's just the market. Um, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a bad thing in my perspective, right? Let's find if you want to focus yeah. on it being a market, it's a market, but it's a market that hopefully will enact good in the world um, in order to address all the things that Joanna and Rumetha were sharing earlier and, you know, in terms of inequities that we're seeing and who's actually being affected by climate change. And the big corporations are, and the governments are the ones that can affect the most change just in terms of volume and what they do and kind of like their stance in the world. So I really do fundamentally believe that that's, you know, that's part of all of our responsibilities to, to, yeah. To, mm -hmm. 
Oh, I love the fact that you say that uh, the role of chief sustainability officer should be only interim. You know? yes. Yeah, it should be gone in the, in, as, as the transition of it. Because every job is, is essentially a climate job. Uh, you know, and you just have to make it, you know, the, you have to look at it a different way and make it right. more. That, that's, that's wonderful. The only, uh, you know, thing that is concerning when you look at uh, the amount of uh, capital that's going into, say, either from private equity or from VC fund into climate tech owned by women, it's appalling, actually. Um, I, was, I was recently looking at PitchBook uh, to see where the capital is flowing. And I think that male-owned or male-founded businesses have had around $10 billion in 2021 compared to a meager $26 million for women-owned founders. And it was said that, uh, you know, when the same idea is being pitched by men and women, uh, funders are more likely to side with the men to take over that business rather than funding the women known. So as you can see, there are some, there is structural discrimination at play and there are certain, perhaps, uh, you know, there are certain things that we can do to collectively attack how women, uh, you know, can become uh, founders and can be the founders of choice for funders. I don't know if you had, and, and if, if IBM is doing any work around empowering women at that level, uh, you know, if you can talk about. Sure. Yeah. So a few thoughts on that. So one, this is not a climate tech issue, right? This is just, this is just a structural issue in general. So what I think the numbers you, you just um, shared, they're not specific to climate tech. It's just more broadly in the VC world. Uh, I was actually just speaking at Fortune's Most Powerful Women Next Gen conference. That was a few weeks ago. And there were a lot of VCs, but increasingly, sorry, there were a lot of founders that were there, all women, obviously, but also there were a lot of investors that were there who are also women. So I think it's about m matching on both sides, right? We do what right. we can to try to make right. sure that we are encouraging other women to get trained up and educate them on how they should, you know, present themselves and whatnot in a way that they can attract more capital from male investors. Right. However, it's also actually empowering to see that women are at the other end of the table now deciding where to dole their dollars as well. And I think we need more of that in order to make effectuate more change. So I think it's on both sides. From an IBM perspective, we do have an, a venture arm and it is something that we consider. So of course it's about, you know, we have certain areas that we focus on around AI and automation and, and security and also sustainability and climate change is one of them. And as we think about which, which areas and which startups we want to invest in, for sure, we are also thinking about what is the criteria behind that. And that includes exactly what you're talking about, Preeti. So right. we're not going to just invest in a woman just because they're a woman, but if they have a valid idea, they have a valid startup idea, their, their business is doing well, their revenue is being generated, everything is like, you know, the way it should be, it's robust. Um, right. then for sure we would consider different criteria, I think, that needs to be. It's all tied to how we think about diversity and inclusion in general, right? Um, and so that needs to be part of the equation as well. Yeah. That's right. And I know, Joanne, you had, you had some thoughts around, around this as well, especially women have proven to be really excellent leaders, and particularly in terms of COVID, if you look at, you know, uh, crisis like uh, COVID, they were excellent leaders. Um, think of all the prime minister women uh, leading their countries. They, they fared much better than the others, if, if I may say so. What has your experience been like and what can we do collectively to put and promote women, more women to positions of power, like Christina is saying, to be the decision makers so that they make a decision uh, which is perhaps more equitable than the decision makers today? I, I do have a lot of experience that, especially with my time in the military. I served with many, many just fantastic women. And in the military, you come up against crisis frequently. And all of them perform just wonderfully, wonderfully calm and, and great at task management and, and just making great decisions. So I think that there is absolute value in that crisis management skill that women definitely bring it to the table. And if you look at companies around the world, the companies that have the most female executives or the most female board members, in climate justice specifically, they tend to uh, operate better. They have a better environmental footprint. They have a better environmental tactics. And I think it comes down to women, uh, I think, as we mentioned, they're a communal kind of um, 
feelings they have when it comes to the world and taking care of each other. They also tend to have a lower uh, uh, carbon footprint to start with, women in general do, um, and they just focus on the environment uh, at a higher percentage than, than, than men around the world. And so I think some of the key things that we need to look at when it comes to getting women into those leadership positions starts at the very bottom with our job descriptions. When we're writing job descriptions to attract uh, people to apply to positions, specifically in science and technology, a lot of times there are very male dominant terms that kind of persuade and push women away from applying and shying away from those types of things. So from an HR standpoint, just taking a look at how are we presenting our companies, how are we presenting our positions, and making sure that it's gender neutral and we're looking across all of the different areas of society to pull in wonderful leaders, whether it is women or men across the board. And now that we are on a more virtual you know, atmosphere, the, the possibilities are endless. There's just such a wide variety of individuals that we can use. We just need to make sure that we're, we're putting out the information the correct way. And I think the other thing that is very near and dear to my heart is education. So we can talk about STEM, we can talk about science and technology, but I think it goes even in, in the global atmosphere, it goes a step further. Education for women is so critical to moving our world together, forward together as a society. So education empowers women. It, it, helps with communication skills. It gives them the confidence to speak up, to speak up in their communities. We need science and uh, technology and women in all of those fields, but we need women in law. We need women in government. We need to have that voice everywhere. And I think uh, something that has you know, just been heart heartbreaking for me over the past few years is seeing that educational right taken away more and more around the world. And I think we as a society need to focus on that and move women forward with education and up and that leads to leadership that brings you that confidence that brings you the ability to walk in and, and make the decisions that we need to make or at least have your voice heard at the table for these decisions and i think we just we as a, as a society need to do a better job of that right and i know rumeka you you run wimix which is exemplary especially when it comes to uh, empowering our communities, which are most at risk. So could you expand a little bit on the work and what are the learnings we can draw from the mix? Yeah, just a, a tying up with what Christina and Joanne uh, mentioned. Um, it's a matter of really bridging. First of all, I think the major gap that we're seeing specifically if we're talking about empowering women for the sake of climate change is one of the problems that we're facing is in addressing gender dimensions of climate change is that mostly all the data that is available at the moment is sex data, so man versus woman or male versus female. And we're not really taking gender into perspective, which is basically the societal structured roles, the behaviors, expressions, and identities are not taken into account. And that's something that we need to kind of do much better at churning that information. And I really hope that a lot of those chief sustainability officers will be able to kind of give that information as we kind of build on more data and more research that is working on. And then connecting on to Joanne's point on the job description part, what's interesting as well is, yes, we need to do better in the job description, but we also need to do better in building women's self-confidence. A very simple example is, a woman would not apply for a job if they don't feel that they meet at least 80% of that job description. And by default, and I'm telling anyone who is actually watching right now, if you meet 80%, you're already overqualified for that position. So you're really looking for a comfort zone and we need to kind of push ourselves out of that. And that's really what we're trying to do with Wimex, like really building women's self-confidence in order for them to really unleash their potential. Um, some statistics that might shock a lot of people is, for instance, seven in 10 girls around the world believe that they're not good enough or do not measure up in some way, be it their looks, performance, relationships, and whatnot. And that really is ingrained since we're little kids that we're not good enough. And we need to do a better job in actually believing in ourselves and getting the community around us as well to really empower us to really believe and also have those uncomfortable conversations that we tend to avoid a lot because society tells us not to question what your elders, what the men in your family tell you is right. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with Wimex is really kind of building the toolkit for women, be it with teaching them negotiation skills, not only for their job salary negotiations, which 
um, seventy percent of the world actually does not um, know. A lot of women don't know that they can actually negotiate their salary, which is in a lot of people who are very much ahead in their careers know that that's a default. So that's something that we are working on ingraining in them, as well as unlocking their network. I mean. We have an amazing network as an individual, but we don't utilize it enough uh, with the proper ask on what we actually want um, and just take it for granted that we actually are not well connected when we actually are. And the last thing is actually we need more women to actually speak up and utilize the public speaking platforms that they have to pass on that message that they are capable of doing whatever they set their minds to. The more and more of us kind of come out of there and show everyone, specifically the men in the world, that we're capable of doing something, that we are equipped, we have the tools, we have everything, the more that we are actually working on breaking that stereotypical view that a lot of us have on gender roles and what women should do and what men should not do and so on. Um, so that that's the, it's a big task, but we're hoping in our little ways that we're doing in Wemex that we're pushing that envelope in order for them to uh, feel empowered to do more in the world. Yeah, it's truly inspiring what you're doing there, particularly uh, women in the global south. And I was born in India and raised in India, so I understand the societal nuances that underpins this this kind of need for empowerment, particularly in terms of confidence and building, get, getting them onto the mainstream. They have the talent; it's just untapped, and and uh, part of it is the conditionings that society puts on you as you grow up. So. Uh, bravo at, at, at doing at doing what you're doing so wonderfully, Umeka. So let me take in a few questions. I see that there are a few questions that have come our way. And this is, again, by no particular, it's not for one of you. It's perhaps for, it's open for any one of you. Uh, the first question that we have is, um, well, let me find the question one second. Uh, What is the best way for those of us who don't have a job dedicated to this space and but deeply care to impact change? What can we do? What is the best way forward for them? Anyone? Yeah, I can touch on that for you. Um, I, I really do think that it's, it, I, I mentioned this earlier, but it's on all of us, right? It's individual decisions that you can make. I go back to how we're thinking about climate change and what we can do in terms of impact there. So it's, it's little things that we can do such as um, you know, washing with cold water instead of hot water. I mean, like kind of like basic things that you can kind of decide in terms of an individual. It's also what you're doing as part of your job. So you can advocate for change within your companies, right? Little things make a big difference. Like we just had folks say something about an event that we had at work where they were using, or it was a partnership or something where they were using plastic cups, like single use plastics. And so, so a few people said something and they said, and they vowed that they would never do that again for any future events, right? So these are all individual things that we can do both in the personal and professional um, areas. I would say, use your voice wherever you are and then implement change wherever you are as well. Like I mentioned how, you know, technology from my perspective can help across all these different functions to help to enact and enable and accelerate change. However, those are all technologies that are being used by people. So if you think that there's a way that your business or your um, role can be more efficient or more efficiently run, if you feel like there's a way that you can do things better, that can actually help to facilitate um, acceleration in your company's sustainability posture, that will help more broadly around climate and climate change. And I think the issue is that we as individuals feel like, oh, well, what can I really do? It's just me. But if you think about the collective action of however many of us are on here, hundreds, thousands, like that really adds up. So I think, please, it doesn't matter if you're in a job, quote unquote, dedicated to this space, like perhaps the folks on, on this call are. Um, it's not going to be Joanne, Rumetha, and I who are going to make all the change among the three of us or the four of us with Preeti. It's going to be all of you that can do that in everything that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I hope that that's like a call to action for folks because it's not it's not just us that's in the space. I think it's everybody. Um, can I jump in with just a couple of points? 
Um, any person can calculate their carbon footprint. You can just Google a carbon footprint calculator, personal carbon footprint calculator, and you can actually know exactly how you can actually reduce those activities that you are taking part in. That's one. The second thing is try your level best as well to be an, an ally and a champion to the girls and women around you. Try to empower them as much as you can, because that really does make a difference as well. Yeah, and I would just, one other thing I would add is vote. Vote in your national. local, oh. vote in your state, oh. vote in your national, put people in power that are going to fight for this cause and that are going to help us mitigate climate change. So good. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, the only other thing I would say is you should educate yourself. Um, and there's lots of fantastic free available data on, on climate. I think every every action you take is predicated on how informed and educated you are on some of these topics. Project Drawdown has been my personal, you know, inspiration. I've been working with Jonathan Foley and you know his team in um, in understanding the different nuances. So please, please feel free to go to the uh, to the website, Project Drawdown, uh, download the videos, educate yourself. Uh, and that, that will help you to make your actions more informed on that. We do have another question, and uh, this one is, I would love to understand more what the role of Chief Sustainability Officer entails. So, Christina, maybe you can <laughs> shed some light uh, on, on that. Sure. So, typically, most large companies and increasingly smaller companies as well, as well as government organizations and other nonprofits, will have these chief sustainability officer roles that essentially take stock of where the organization is in, in terms of their sustainability posture and articulate where they need to go. So, what is the strategy that we have? What are the commitments that we're committing to? The net zero by 2030 or by 2050 is a really easy example of that. That's the one I mentioned earlier that most companies have. So the chief sustainability officer, I'll say CSO for short, the CSO will help to articulate those goals in tandem with the CFO, the CEO, the rest of the C-suite. And then their job is really as a, a change manager, right? A change agent within the organization to work across the organization and help to achieve those goals. They themselves and their teams are really... Um, they're enablers of that change. They're not doing it themselves, right? As I mentioned, if your company works through data centers, has factories, has supply chain, you know, like all of these things that, that you have buildings that you work in office buildings, those are all different pieces to the overarching sustainability posture and holistic view of the company. Mm -hmm. All of the data that is coming from all of those different areas of the business needs to be kind of brought into one place for them to understand exactly what's happening and where the problem areas are so they can focus on those problem areas and work with the owners of the business operations within those areas to decrease the carbon footprint or increase diversity or whatever the goals are that have been articulated. And there are increasingly an, an enormous number, <laughs> over 600 right now, uh, different like frameworks and guidelines and all of these things that will, I think, will start to consolidate as we go go further and further down. However, um, there are companies that are signing up for one, if not multiples of those to help them to streamline how they think about their goals and their commitments and then the action and the strategy against that. So that's what CSOs do and they have to do it in conjunction with the rest of the organization. Joanne, anything you would add from what you see at Suncom and no others? Uh, I think I agree absolutely with Christina. Uh, their job is to work across the company. That's the most important part, I think, of what a chief sustainability officer does. And it it's wonderful, Christina, that you mentioned how many different aspects it touches. Things that you don't even think about, you know, what light bulbs you use in a building can significantly <laughs> impact the, the energy usage. So a chief sustainability officer has such a wide reaching uh, impact across the company. And I do agree, Christina, I hope someday we don't need them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Uh, agreed. I do have another question coming in. Um, I am passionate about the environment. And I, if I could have, I would have started my career in that field. Is there a way for people who aren't complete currently in the space to find a way to get into the industry or find work adjacent to it? Absolutely. 
So uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act that just came through recently, there's been a lot of money put into the uh, transition of our energy system across the, com the country specifically. And that the market for uh, environmental compliance and all of the things that touch the climate action is growing rapidly, specifically at SunCommon. Go to our website. We have job openings. Uh, if you're interested, take a look. Uh, and now within the virtual world, the job uh, market for these types of positions are just booming everywhere. Indeed's a great place to start. I know that we put on there and you can actually you know, streamline down to what specific field you want to look at. But there is a lot of opportunity out there for this specific industry. Yeah, if I could add to that. So uh, I get this question a lot. The, the way that you can support across any really is, is, I should say, you can really support across any function. So as an example, ESG type of regulations are coming out all around the world. And so our finance team, which had never thought about or cared about ESG issues before, all of a sudden have to. Same with our legal function, right? Because all of a sudden there are regulations that IBM as a company and every other major company out there has to start abiding by and reporting against. So finance folks are thinking about it now. Our lawyers are thinking about it now. So it's not just, you know, an environmental scientist that has a role in this. I would say there are also a lot of like certificates out there, free certificates through lots of different universities that you can take to just show if you're thinking about applying yourself in the space, hey, I have the functional expertise of what you need, but also I'm showing my interest through this certificate program that I've done. Um, and then like Joanne was saying, because there are so many options out there right now around this, I would say just focus on the functional capability that you can bring and then just tie that into whatever the environmental or climate space that you're, that you're trying to get into. Um, but also I'll step in and say that the best way and the quickest way to actually build on your subject matter knowledge is volunteering in your local NGO. Um, there are various NGOs, I'm pretty sure of that, that are specific to a specific type of um, the environment and climate change. And you could just tap into one and just see how you could help. Mm -hmm. And you will realize that there's a wealth of things that you could definitely do and support either with their work with the government or working with their communities as well. Absolutely. In fact, Rometa, I would have also brought up that there are many community events that happen and community networking events, not just if you're if you're volunteering, you obviously build a community around it. But there are specific job related communities in every, uh, you know, in various cities around the nation that you should join and actively participate in events. So you build your network again to Rometa's earlier point is that as women, we don't actually think that we have a network, whereas we do. And we're just about showing up and, mm -hmm. and making the connections. So please, please do that. Uh, one other question that has come in is, um, I'm in the healthcare industry, which contributes significantly to climate change and pollution, particularly in the reliance of single use plastics, uh, which are considered lifesavers. I was wondering if any of you have come across ideas to address that issue. It's single-use plastics. That's a really good question. Um, I will say I have come across multiple companies, smaller companies and startups that are investing in um, the equivalent of plastics. I can't think of the materials offhand right now, but it's the equivalent of plastics, but they're not plastics. And so I think that there is, uh, there is a movement around addressing exactly what you're saying. I would look into it. I, I can't speak to it with authority, but um, I know that there are folks thinking the same thing as, as yeah. whoever asked the question. So thank you for asking. I don't know Actually, medical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, please, Rometa. Um, so um, I, it's very interesting that this was brought up because I was watching um, the, uh, I don't know if you watch New Amsterdam, one of the episodes during the pandemic really did address climate change and how the hospital administration was trying to kind of minimize their, um, their carbon emissions, including plastic. And one of the ways that um, has been interesting and that led me to kind of search for a bit more is that there is actually a notion at the moment at the American Medical Association where they're working on how to... Um, 
recycle and reuse medical plastics and make it as economically viable as possible. Where it has reached, though, is something that I don't know as of yet, but this was something that was started back in 2021. So maybe start digging deeper into that and know more on how they're doing it. Right, right. And there is there are there are a couple of steps in it is just, uh, you know, just first is just reducing our reliance on single use plastics itself and looking for alternate, uh, you know, material to actually use for medical devices and medical appliance uh, applications. And then, of course, there is the waste management part of it is, can you make it circular into actually create, you know, dispose it and there are certain they are trying to find their like Christina was saying, there are some smaller company uh, companies and venture companies that are trying to figure out different microbes that actually can eat single use plastics and consume it and metabolize it actually. Um, so there is different, well, I guess, research being done at the moment on how do you recycle the plastic use uh, either into creating something else um, or just decompose and recycle um, that medical waste. But it's definitely, harder in the healthcare uh, life sciences industry uh, than the others, I think. Yeah. So thank you for the question. We are only a minute away, but I do have to uh, pose a question to the three panelists, at least. What gives you hope for the future? And I know Christina's the optimistic one <laughs> anyways. I feel like you have to be. be. <laughs> you have to be. I, I yeah. agree. I completely agree. What gives you hope for the future? Uh, I think the younger generation gives me so much hope because they really want, they're really not happy with the status quo at the moment. Things need to change and there's a lot of pressure. And um, what we're also seeing that there's more and more, as I think Christina alluded to this, where she said there's more and more women who are investing at the moment. We're seeing more and more young people investing and pushing a lot of these um, conventional, for instance, fossil fuel companies to really um, change their game when it comes to climate change. So that's what's giving me hope. But time is ticking and we need all of us to kind of work together and join forces to make that change. Joanne. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with uh, the younger generations. I have a 17 year old daughter and her and her friends have, I overhear the discussions they're having and they are on, they do feel a lot of pressure and they feel that they're going to have to solve this. So I think there is time involved with us getting the ball rolling even more, but I'm, it does bring me hope that they're already talking about it at their age. And I would also say that events like this, this is the fact that we're talking about it. We have a huge audience that is asking questions and is interested and in, we're getting the voices out there just to get the conversation going can make such a great impact. And I see it growing every day and that's very inspirational. Christina. I'll just echo what the other two women have said. Um, the only other thing, and I think that this is still too slow, we're at the two point where time is ticking and we're not moving fast enough though. I do think it helps that there are regulations coming in, right? It will force actors to do what they need to do. I mean, I know we're having a lot of back and forth, back and forth on what and how and all of that around the world, but you know, the EU is taking charge and a lot of countries are not that far behind. That will force entities and people to start thinking about this in a more real way. And so, you know, hopefully that will also help to accelerate where we need to go. Right. Well, that's all the time we have. Well, thank you so much, ladies. It was an honor and a pleasure to share the stage with you and such an interesting uh, conversation. I hope you found the, our audience, you found the uh, conversation informative, enriching, and that you will stay tuned for the stellar agenda that uh, Marisela and Megan have uh, for you the later half of today. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.